Hello and welcome to the Nishguarda YouTube podcast show powered by citiesabc.com, businessabc.net, and sportsabc.org. Once again, we continue profiling global personalities, authors, and the makers and the doers that are changing the world we live in. It's a quite complex world full of disruption, full of dilemmas, and full of challenges. But as well, with every challenge comes an opportunity. And uh, one of the things that I always like to highlight in these 300 plus interviews that we've been doing is that I think every person that I speak, I learn immensely and I'm very grateful for all the people and for the audience as well that has been coming with us, that has been growing, but as well is how we can actually use this knowledge and this experience and these different interactions to create value for all of us. And today I'm particularly excited and actually, to be honest, I have a a sense of curiosity and the sense of, uh, as well, I would say, knowledge that I want to to get from my fellow author and the personality that I'm bringing to the platform. So today I welcome to the series, Dr. Roger De Silk, and we're talking about a, a leading global financial and the philanthropy experts, an author as well, and the personality that has been working in wealth management with over three decades of experience advising some of the biggest organizations in the world and the net worth individuals and families. Dr. Roger De Silk is the CEO of Sterling Foundation Management and uh, one of the first national or U.S. national charitable consultants, consulting and management firms. And it's been, his life experience is quite impressive to say less. He's also the president of Lifetime Perspectives, Inc., an organization that provides innovative solutions in philanthropy and finance, is the founder and board member of several non-profit organizations and the former bond trader at the World Bank. Roser is a multi-author of multi-books, and uh, some of the books include Managing Foundations and Charitable Trusts from Wiley, Creating a Private Foundation from Wiley, Politicians Spend, We Pay, a Sterling Lifetime Press 2022. Part of the, the focus of, of this interview is about this new book, The Investor's Dilemma Decoded, that was published this year, 2024, by Wiley, and is a guide on personal finance, and like the title suggests, in all the challenges that we're going through when it comes to the investor's dilemma decoded in a time of code. So as a speaker and as a, an international personality, Dr. Roger has been spoken to audiences around the planet and in types and uses of both finance, investment, and charitable entities and causes. And he also frequently has been involved in educational organizations around finance, professional education, and focus in integration of full suite of finance, personal finance, investment, and charitable entities into the financial planning process. Dr. Roger holds a PhD and an MA in Applied Economics from Stanford University, as well as a BA in Economics with distinction and he earned his CFA in 1990. So I could go for a lot more, but I'm quite quite excited and as well honored to have Dr. Roger and welcome to our series. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure is all mine. So I, I want to, I always start by the beginnings. I, I think on this, I'm linear. So can you tell us a bit about with a, such, a, such a fantastic trajectory of your career, your life, how did the, all of this started? So what was the, the first step and how did you end up actually becoming this personality that you are today. I'll, uh, I'll try to give you some of the, the highlights as, and you mentioned, you mentioned quite a few of them. I had been interested, I have been interested in economics and financial markets since I was in high school and I read a lot of the popular stuff and basically got confused. And then when I got to Stanford, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to undergraduate there and I studied economics and I liked it and was again, fortunate to have some professors, particularly a man named Roger Gray, who uh, sadly died a number of years ago. He was a mentor and his colleague, another professor, a woman named Ann Peck was also a mentor. And they invited me into the world kind of, even when I was an undergraduate of applied economics, looking at markets, they were both experts 
in, as it happens, uh, commodity markets. And I ended up, they invited me to apply to the PhD program there. I did, I was fortunate to get in and I studied futures markets and options in graduate school at Stanford. So that was back in the eighties. From there, as I went to the world bank and got to try out some of these things in, in, in the real world. And one of the fantastic things about the World Bank for me was the opportunity to actually make decisions in markets. I think in a lot of other firms, like on Wall Street, they might pay you more, but at least when you're a junior person, you don't have as much authority. At the World Bank, there was kind of a trade-off. I got a lot of authority very quickly, obviously within guidelines, but I got to be trading and pricing stuff very, very quickly. I also want to, if, uh, if I can, give a thank you to my first mentor at the World Bank. His name is Bob Webb. He's a professor at the University of Virginia. I'm still in touch with him. And uh, he, he, he helped this kid who was wet behind the ears, never done anything, get comfortable pricing literally millions of dollars of transactions within a couple of weeks of being on the job. And so then it's just gone from there. Well, that's that's beautiful. I love that you you keep that respect for your mentors. It's one of the things that I, I think I should do more often to my mentors as well. And especially for people like you, you are actually a mentor for thousands of people around the world with your work, ethics, and as well with your writing and different parts. So part of your fantastic career. So I want to touch a bit on the World Bank because in the World Bank, you had a fantastic trajectory that includes managing a lot of very high profile different positions and as well managing substantial different parts of us you're responsible for a multi-billion dollars repo portfolio in the world bank and you work in a lot of different variations so how did the the work in particular the world bank establish then your work moving for different areas from philanthropy and as well education and finance and all these different parts that you are right now a global authority? Well, as I mentioned, I've been interested in economics for forever. And markets are one of those places where economics intersects the real world in a very visible way. And I was at the World Bank for two years. As you mentioned, I was, and I got a lot of experience in the money markets and the bond market, which are really the basis of everything. I mean, I think bonds, everybody who wants to be investing should understand bonds. And there's no better way to do that. Most people won't have the opportunity. But if you have to, if you have to price them, if you have to buy them and sell them and arbitrage them, you got to understand how they work, at least from what it is and value point of view. And the World Bank really gave me a tremendous opportunity to do that right out of school. I mean, I got a kind of a baptism by fire almost because what you learn in school is all very theoretical. And then in the real world, is the, the, the big difference is there are people in the real world. In school, in the books, there are no people there. It's everything is just the way it is printed black and white. This was in the 80s, late 80s. It was, have you ever read the book Liar's Poker? There's a lot in there. This is one of those Michael Lewis books about the bond markets in the 80s. And I, I got to observe a lot of that. And he, he, that's a fairly accurate representation, although I think he took things that he'd seen or that various people had seen all over the place over a large period of time and compressed them into a better story. But it turns out that the World Bank, as you know, is a large, fairly bureaucratic organization. And I felt like I was more entrepreneurially inclined than would fit very well in the framework of a large bureaucratic organization like the World Bank. So I left after a couple of years and I kind of went to the other end of the spectrum. I ran a, I was hired to run a family office for a newly liquid, wealthy family in the East, East Coast of the US. At that time, and this was about 1990, they had about $50 million liquid assets. And that's a lot of money. But back in 1990, that was, I think, relatively speaking, a tremendous amount of money. It's probably more like a quarter of a billion now would be in the US. And they 
brought me on. It was a very small team. And so I got to get a lot of experience dealing with actual individuals, high net worth people who were acting for their own account. I got a lot of, that's where I first got my involvement with philanthropy. Cause one of the, one of the most lasting projects that I did for them was to create the family foundation, which still exists. And I think most, not all, but a lot of high net worth people have some interest in philanthropy. And so I developed my, I started developing my expertise way back then working with this, with this particular family. If you can contextualize, probably how did you end up in the areas of, from that experience and you end up then starting to write and build your work as an author, because that's the, the idea of this question. Feel free. I started writing while I was at the World Bank. I discovered, I started writing about very technical money market matters for lay audiences. So I decided, I determined when I was working on my PhD, I realized that I could probably add more value translating some of this academic material and insights for non-professionals. One of the very first things that I wrote, Dennis, was there's a, the, t the technical details don't matter. Something called a discount note, and it really doesn't matter what it is anymore. It's, it's kind of faded from the scene, but I wrote a piece for doctors explaining how this might be an alternative that would be useful for them to talk to their investment people about instead of, say, money market funds or treasury bills or something like that. The point is that was well received. And of course, you know, this, a writer always likes to get his work published. So I started writing more. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So I was at the family, the family office for four and a half years. And I realized during that time, I worked on some really major nonprofit projects, kind of in addition to my job. They weren't part of my job. But if I was working 40 hours, then I'd probably put another 20 hours a week into a nonprofit project. And on that project, I worked very closely with the man who's now my business partner, Jim Lintot. He's also a dear friend. And we did that for a couple of years. And we both realized that we had developed all this expertise in the nonprofit world and in the high net worth world, because he was also working for a different, very high net worth family. And in the late 90s, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but that was the, the dot com boom. And so we found that many of our contemporaries where suddenly they were young in their 30s and suddenly multi, multi, multi millionaires. And we, we knew people who, they were employees. They weren't even necessarily the founders, but they were worth $50 million. And they said, this is kind of special. I really want to make a difference. And so Jim and I decided to basically become entrepreneurs. We set up Sterling Foundation Management in 1998. We were fortunate. We quickly brought on board a number of these people who we knew. We set up foundations for them. And then it's sort of taken off from there. Fantastic history. So so on that one, before we go continue on this, is, sorry, I like the, a good storytelling. So how did you pick so this relationship from the investment side, from as well the managing different portfolios, starting to write, and then you start the foundations unit? So it was something that was more of a passion or you thought you could make more a, a change. Just a bit of that history, because that, of course, is reflected in your books. And I want to go there. But before that, I want to touch just this a bit more to finish the, the first chapter about your history. Why did I go into basically philanthropy and finance rather than investment? Yes. So part of that is, is pure chance or divine intervention, however you choose to see those things. I, when I was, so I was in graduate school, I finished in 1988. In 1987, I was starting to look for jobs and I had two standing offers. One was from Goldman Sachs, one was from a, a money management firm that's no longer around. And I was planning to do one of those. But then you remember the crash of 87 and all of those were rescinded. So my career went off in a different direction. I ended up at the World Bank. And when I left the World Bank 
1990, that was another depressed period. That was uh, the convertible bonds had completely collapsed. And junk was in the, it was, a, it was not a good market time. There was that war. And anyway, so actually managing money just didn't happen. And so initially by chance, the philanthropic or orientation came about, but then, you know, you develop expertise, you find out that you're good at things and that there's a need for it. And also, as you said, there is, I mean, it's hard to know what quote unquote, the world really needs, but it seemed like there was more opportunity to add value in the philanthropic world than being yet another money manager. And money, I mean, a lot of my close associates are money managers and say very, very, I, I don't know how good I would be at it compared to the level of skill that's required, right? Because it's maybe one, of, it's probably one of the most competitive fields in the whole world. I that it is. It's, well, it's, it's a fantastic how life brings these two different parts and as well, how your trajectory end up actually making one of the global last person in these areas. So from your multiple books that you publish, you've been actually looking at different areas. And of course, as we speak, you launch a book that I use as the same title as a very historical book. So I want to I wanna see why you choose this name. So the, there's the historical book from 2008, the Investor Dilemma, which is a classical, like how mutual funds are betraying your trust and what to do about it from Louis Lowenstein. And in your case, you choose the investor dilemma decoded. So let, let's look at this. So why you choose this title? And if you could present a bit about this book, because this book touches a lot of things. It's a very important book for people listening to us. They want to control your finances in different parts, but we'll go that afterwards. I'll start by the title and why this revisitation. So before we actually even answer that, Dennis, one of the, one of the side effects, which I think is a benefit, of me not being an investment manager is I don't have an ax to grind in terms of investments. Turns out that many authors of many excellent books, they are in the business. And so maybe it's some subtle way that biases them towards what they do. I think it's important that because we don't do that, we are very agnostic about, we don't care how people do it, we just want to be able to be free to say, this is how we see it. So the subtitle, <clears throat> excuse me, the subtitle talks about misinformation and noise. And I think there are few fields where there's so much noise as in finance and investing and personal finance, everything from you know CNN and CNBC and all the MSNBC, the places that are running in the background and the the tape is running at the bottom and there's constantly people talking, constant this, that, you know, buy this, you must buy that. This is going to, the end of the world is going to be next week. Or or if you don't get on the AI bandwagon now, you're going to be lost or you must buy crypto or never buy crypto, all that noise. And because of my background and my desire to help the next generation, right? It's like sort of what would I have wanted to know when I was 25 or 30 and starting out in terms of saving and investing that I know now and maybe can help people who are younger. And that's, Catherine was of course, very instrumental in, in helping that be the focus. But of course, it's not just for young people, but if you're young, you have the most opportunity to change the trajectory going forward. The idea was not to tell people what to think, Many, many, there's no shortage of finance and investment people out there telling people what to think. We want to try to teach people or let them teach themselves how to think about investing. And so in order to do that, I think we had to start, I thought it was a good idea to start at the very beginning. And what I think of as the very beginning is the time value of money. Essentially, a dollar today, everything else equal is more valuable than a dollar in a year. That's the basic concept. And everything in investing is built on that foundation. And so we have a whole chapter on it in the book. And of course there's some math, but you don't really need that much math. But a lot of people have the math 
and it's useful for them that they can be shown how to use it so that the wool doesn't get pulled over their eyes. So for example, many people don't really know how to calculate a rate of return. They don't, maybe they don't know what a realistic rate of return is or why. And the math to do that is really quite simple. And we, we have that in the book. We then go to, at least from a theoretical point of view, what any investment asset is worth is defined by the present value of the expected cash flows. So what that means, and I obviously don't want to give a course here on present value or, or that kind of thing, but it's basically the idea that since a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future, if you have a dollar in the future, a dollar in a year, and then another year, and then another year. So for example, that's what that's why bonds are so basic. I mentioned earlier that bonds are very basic to understanding investing. And the reason for that is there are fewer things, there are few mo fewer moving parts with a bond. So a, a, a typical bond, so I don't know why in the US, bonds pay semi-annually, that means twice a year. In Europe, they tend to pay once a year. The once a year is easier to easier to model and understand. So I'll use that. But essentially, like take a five-year bond. <clears throat> What's the value of a five-year bond? The value is what are the cash flows? So say it's a, a ten thousand dollar bond with, and I'm going to use unrealistic but super easy numbers so that people can follow it. Say the interest rate on the bond was ten percent, the the yield, the coupon. So that means thousand dollars pays 10%, that's $100. So you get $100 after one year, another $100 after two years, another $100 after three, four. And then in year five, you get the $100 interest plus the bond, plus the principal. So what what is that worth? Well, we figure out what that's worth because all we need to know there is what's the correct interest rate, which we get from the market. And so we walk people through that in the book. And, and, and it's a little bit complicated if you've never done it before, but it's not rocket science. We then, we then go from there to stocks. And of course, the hard part about stocks is you don't know what those cash flows are going to be. And there is no maturity, right? A, a stock, at least if it doesn't go under or get bought, it lasts forever. So a much more difficult thing is to figure out what are the cash flows. And we have a chapter on that. So the book is, is quite a successful book. It has around 368 pages. And just to repeat, so is the investor's dilemma decoded, recognize misinformation, filter the noise and reach your goals by Dr. Roger De Silk and Katrina A. Silk. And it's a book that, like I said, it has multiple chapters that highlight all these different things. So I, I think before we go more in details, I want to just, uh, so if I look more from a holistic perspective, so what I love about the book is that there's an entire masterclass, there's actually a PhD in, in finance and the history of money. And it has a lot of things. And I like it's very practical, like you said, but it can go through all the layers, like you said, of the noise around misinformation about the man, the, the investor component. So I want to touch that element. You touched before, before you go deep on the book. And of course, I want people to read the book because I think it's a great book for people, especially anyone that wants to have control of their personal finance and personal investment. So what this level of the misinformation, noise and confusion, because of course, this isn't the title. If you could elaborate a bit more on that, because in fact, like you said, there's a huge amount. And now we have not only all the, the conventional finance, but we have conventional finance. We have alternative finance with all the parts. We have decentralized finance with all crypto and all the bubbles that have been coming from that. So from, from this kind of misinformation, so for someone that wants to dive in your book and wants to learn and take control of their personal finance, which is probably the most important thing out of this book. What would be the first advice you give to people looking into this area? Learn the basics. And by, by the basics, I mean what we just talked about, the time value of money, which is really pretty simple. And you don't have to, you don't have to be able to reproduce the math to understand how it works. And the reason that I say learn the basics and, the, and to that time value of money and then the basically fact that the quote unquote intrinsic value, now there is no such thing as actual intrinsic value. Things only have value because people value them, which is why you can have things like crypto that have quote unquote no value that have lots of market value. But most of history suggests as Benjamin Graham, who was Buffett's teacher and maybe the greatest single figure in investing 
in the in a in the theory of investing. He made the observation that the markets in the short run are a voting machine, which means things can go in the short run, they can go anywhere. But in the long run, he says, markets are a weighing machine. And by that, he means ultimately the cash that an investment can produce is ultimately going to determine its market value. And so that's a good that's a good analogy to keep in mind always when you're thinking crypto is, is maybe one of today's most extreme examples. But we see it in stocks all the time. And crypto is a hard one to analyze because as far as we can tell, there are no cash flows. But if we take take something like a stock, a company, what I would like for people to be able to do, and I don't think it's that difficult, is that they understand the basics, they understand that an investment is worth the present value of the cash that it's going to produce. And so then, like, take Apple, which is the most, one of the most popular, probably the biggest market cap today, close to $3 trillion. And I hear people, oh, Apple's going to double. A- Apple's about, I don't know where it is exactly today, but it's about 180 per share. And people are out there saying, well, it's going to go to 500 a share. It's going to go to 1,000 a share. And bef- I want people to be, your listener, to be able to say, is that realistic? What's the probability of that? And it's really not that hard to understand how to think about that. And so here's one way to think about it. Dennis, the answer is, as I said, anything is possible. But is it probable? Is it probable that Apple is going to go to 500 in any short period of time or 1,000 in any short period of time? And so one way to think about it is you look at Apple today, and let's say it's at 180 per share, and Apple earns $6 per share, which is about where it is. So that means that Apple is trading at 30 times earnings, right? If it earns $6 a share, 30 times 6 is the 180 that it's producing per share. That's the third, they call that a 30 price earnings ratio. So we can do a very, very, very simple calculation. We say, if Apple has to go to 500, what has to happen to the earnings? If that multiple, if that price earnings ratio stays constant at 30. And so you can do the math. And earnings would have to go to something like $16.5 a share, which that doesn't mean much to anybody because per share numbers are hard to relate to the real world. But if you then step back and say, I'm going to look at the whole company, and today that whole company is worth roughly $3 trillion and earns roughly $100 billion, $100 billion of earnings. That earnings, you're, when if you're saying Apple is going to go from 180 to 500, without there being a big increase in the earnings multiple, you're saying that those earnings are going to go from roughly 100 billion to 260 billion or something like that. And obviously nothing's impossible, but you have to say, okay, Apple already has the entire world as its market. How is it going to produce that kind of growth? I mean, not impossible. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but I am saying that somebody can do, and you could do that in five minutes or less once you kind of learn how to think about it. And that's what I want people to be able to take away so that they can more or less ignore the guy on the TV who's just, you know, getting his soundbite in. Is that, is that, is that kind of question that you're asking? No, I love it. I love it. And this is actually very important what you highlighted now, because that's what I want to go, because books like yours are key. But the general education, even me that I have a master, to be honest, in all my education, I had zero money education. I think I had a teacher actually. One year, there was my teacher of, I think, economics that uh, taught me the, a bit of the basics of money. And it's really a problem because most of the education systems, they ignore the basics that you are talking about. And I think that's why I love, I love about your book, that you actually go, and the book is all about that. Is that. For instance, if you look at the chapter one, time value of money, which is key, is about, you can save money at no cost. And that's these kind of things. And that's what you said exactly. There's a bit of, not a bit, there's a lot of common sense that is missing in all the the part of the investment and the part of education around finance. So from a, from the, the book, let, let's continue, of course, the ideas for people to read the book. So you touched the part right now about the basic assumption that, of course, the market can only go so far. And we are in a time of bubbles because we have the technology bubbles, we have the, the capital markets bubbles, you have, like you mentioned, even, even a company like Apple, the financial experts or financial analysts can can come up with something and sometimes create a bubble out of nothing and that's been happening more than often. But from your experience, and I think that's the beauty about the book and I think your experience is that 
event steady, building value and keeping value. So, so picking in, in the book, and I think probably you have the time value of money, I would like to touch a bit that. And as well, the second, your second chapter, there is the basic investment analysis. So how do you combine these two things? Because I think a lot of the challenge, especially if you go to the world economy, we have, I always do this macro, I want your opinion on that, is that if you look at the macroeconomic, the world economy is around 70 to $80 trillion, but the debt it's around, well, no one knows exactly, but probably 400 to 500 trillion. But the speculative instruments and der derivatives and all the different parts, some cases go to over one, well, I would say $1,000 trillion plus. So that's, that's a, and this is some numbers that I've been calculating for some time because of course, there's not even a consensus around this. So how do you look at this from your experience, especially the steadiness, that's what I love about your experience as both a researcher, but as well as both a portfolio manager and as well managing multiple steady business and applying this just to the two chapters. And I suggest people to read it, time value of money and basic investment analysis. So I believe that most individuals, I know with families and probably even most money managers don't focus on the macro picture so much as they do on the economics of a specific investment that they're considering. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Right now in the United States, farmland is really, really high. We talk about this in the book. We have a, we have a whole chapter on it. And people point to the fact that farmland has been a really excellent investment for the last 30 years on average. But if you look into it, you say farmland is not magic, like no investment is magic. What is the value of a given plot of farmland. Well, in the long run, the value is the present value of the cash that that farmland will provide to its owner. And just like any investment, right? We talked about Apple. Apple earnings is what determines the value of a share of Apple. Well, same thing is true of farmland. So present value, so that's the, that's the first chapter that you talked about. You have to understand how that, what that even means, right? I mean, if, I mean here's an example. In today, an average piece of farmland in the U.S., cropland, cropland, is to the owner, the typical owner owns the land and rents it out to the person who actually farms it. They rent it out for what's called a cash rent yield, a cash rent, which then produces a yield. So in t and the, I'll explain that in a minute. So let's say that the value the market value of, of, a, of an acre of farmland is uh, $10,000. So they might be renting it out for $300 a year. That's 3% cash yield. So I could put my money in the bank and earn 5%. I'm talking US dollars right now. So what am I as an investor, let's say I'm looking at the question of, do I buy this farmland? Do I pay $10,000 an acre for this land that I can rent out for $300 an acre? That's a 3% yield in a world where interest rates are 5%. So what I, in order for that to be a good investment, the value of the land has to rise by at least 2% a year just to break me even with what I could have gotten if I put my money in the bank, right? But we, and then, so then you have to ask as a potential investor, what's going to gener generate that 2%? And, and I don't want to own farmland just to equal, because there's a lot more risk than sticking it. When I say the bank, you could substitute treasury bonds or treasury notes. So the so-called riskless investment is you know, guaranteed return and the chances that you won't get paid are remote, okay? So you're gonna have to, in order to justify the investment in farmland, you're gonna wanna get more than five, you're probably gonna want at least seven or eight, what's my, what's my alternative investment with a similar kind of risk that could give me the same kind of return. So what's gonna generate, you have to then ask yourself, so that's very, very simple analysis says, okay, at a current yield of 3%, this farmland has to increase in value by maybe four or 5% a year just to be a decent investment. Not a great investment, but a decent investment. What can generate that? Well, increase in rents. What can increase? And so you look at, well, what, is the, what does the farmland do? What could it do? Can, it grow, can a farmer grow more crops on it? Can it increase their yield? Can the price of grain that they're growing rise sufficiently to make it more profitable for the farmer so that they're 
the rent increases is sustainable. And so these these kinds of questions, I don't have, I'm not trying to answer those, just saying that those kinds of questions, they literally take like five minutes or less for the potential investor to raise those questions. And then in the case of farmland, I personally think that it's much near. And if you look at the history of farm prices, farmland prices in the US, they have very long cycles, like 30 or 40 year cycles. And it's in the book, we did an analysis, but we said, we think that the main, so farms have, farmland has been going up for, like I say, 30 or 35 years. Well, what's been changing in that time? Interest rates have been dropping. And they're, those are very closely connected because what's the value of the farmland? Present value of the future cash flows. Well, present value is mostly a function of interest rates. So lower interest rates mean everything else equal, higher present value. That kind of analysis, Dennis, is what I'm trying to teach people to be able to do for themselves. And it's not that hard. Now, that is... That is the kind of things I think is missing at universities and even a lot of business schools, because I think if we don't get the basics in place, we cannot create and control our personal finance. So I'm, I'm trying to respect the time. There's still a couple of minutes. So from the book, so you go through the basic investment analysis and there's the book has all the different chapters. I'm not going through everything. There's all the different varieties of products that you can use for investment once you get the basics in place. So from Let's just look here. So from bond and fixed loan, I want just to have your opinion. You have equities, and of course, we have real estate, and there's gold and gold stocks and future and commodities and mutual funds. So what would be from these products and from your experience for someone that is in the investor dilemma or an investor understanding? And I think I would treat my audience as a, as a middle because this is a podcast about technology and business. So I would say that most of people are probably early investors, they're not, they don't have all the experience. They might be very good in technology, but they have very low experience. And I would say 99% of the world population have zero investor capacity. When you look at the numbers, it's probably 0.01% of the world population that has some kind of experience as an investment. So what would be from an education perspective? I know that education is quite important for you as well. But during this kind of different Let's say if you would create the basic portfolio and if you want to start your own control of your personal finance, the areas that you would highlight within the book and within your experience. I think many people, Dennis, would benefit from having a better understanding of risk. We can all understand return. I think risk is harder to understand. We do have an extended treatment of risk in the book. The, the way that finance theory typically treats risk is volatility. How much does an investment bounce around in price? There's not universal agreement that that's the right definition of risk, but it's a very useful one, both, well, I mean, historically, it's been very useful. Whether it will continue to be going forward is a different question, and we can get to that later. But one of the basic concepts of portfolio, you use the term portfolio, which is a really important term, is diversification, right? We have a portfolio because a properly constructed portfolio, so just in case, in, a portfolio is more than one investment. It's a whole set of investments. And the holy grail is to have investments that produce returns that the one is independent of the other. So an ideal portfolio, which doesn't exist, would have a very smooth, continuous upward trajectory, even though it might have pieces in it, some are going up, some are going down. So the idea of a portfolio is it, it's easiest to see in the case of stocks, because on any given day, some stocks are up and other stocks are down. And the, the, there's a lot of math to deal with exactly how you treat that. We talk about that, but you don't have to understand it. But you do have to understand the concept of you have everything else equal. If you have one or two or a small number of investments, you have more risk that you don't have to get, that you don't have to have. They call it diversifiable risk that if you, if you own the whole market. So that's one big reason, Dennis, why historically index funds tend to outperform most money managers. And it's just one reason is they're more diversified when you have Everything else equal. If you have less diversification, you have more risk. And again, and the math of this is quite complicated. 
but more risk, everything else equal, reduces your expected return. And I don't want to, the math is in the book if people want to know it, but but you, when you diversify properly, you not only reduce your risk, but you also increase your expected return. And so how do I translate that for people? What what asset classes? So we have, we'll talk about asset classes because there's tons of research that shows that what they call asset allocation is like how much in stocks, how much in bonds, how much in cash, how much in real estate, and then maybe you choose some other other uh, alternatives or whatever. That allocation decision is more important than the specific stocks you pick, unless you pick. I mean, if you, as long as you pick a wide variety of stocks, it's it's like if I had half in half in stocks and half in bonds, that has a bigger impact on my the performance of the portfolio and specifically which bonds are specifically which stocks I pick. So so at a high level, how do you get that asset allocation? And it, the big, big question, the big is how much in fixed income and how much in equities? Uh, we, and we have a whole chapter devoted to that. And what we found, and we did some very extensive simulations, we wrote some code in R and we did a whole bunch of simulations based on assumptions they're based on history, and we have another section on history in the book. And I recommend that people look at that, especially young people, because the traditional, if you look at all the all the advertising in this country, and a lot of it's regulated by the SEC in this country, and a higher exposure to equities is considered higher risk. And in terms of portfolio volatility, that makes a lot of sense. But if you think of a different approach to risk, which is what is my risk of not achieving my goals? Which is, that's what the, the, the subtitle of the book is, the third, the final part is achieve your goals, right? Because it doesn't do you any good to have a very stable portfolio and then retire and run out of money in two years. That's not what anyone wants. And what we find, and, we, and we're not trying to, I don't want anyone to take our word for it. It's like, look, do it yourself if you want. But especially when you're young, the more quote unquote risk, the more allocation to equities, the lower your chance of running out of money when you're old. It's exactly the opposite of the normal idea of, well, stocks are risky, bonds are safe. And so we talk about that a lot. And is that a, you touched a lot of things that I think for people listening to us, probably pause and re listen to it again. I think, of course, depends on the expertise, depends on their capacity. So I know for the sake of time, and I want to be respectful. So I think we have time for two more inter questions. So the book like, is a masterclass that goes for a lot of different things. And for people listening to us, for instance, the chapter, chapter 10 goes to financial leverage, 165, page 165. Then there's a, a chapter about risk that you mentioned already. And as well, assembling a portfolio. The portfolio, I think, is very important because if you start on these areas, you have to go there and you have to take this. So. One of the things that you mentioned, and for instance, is that you did a considerable history analysis around some of this. And there's, of course, an entire chapter about portfolio simulations, which is, I think, uh, based on cash and the world equity markets that is simulating a variety of portfolios based on cash on the world equity market. So from this analysis of history, what would be the conclusions that you bring, probably in a summary, of course, because like you said, you have to start with the basics and then go and depend of, of course, of the people listening to us, how advanced they are. And even me, that I've been in finance and, and trading for a long time, I need to continue learning. And like you said, it's about managing risk, my portfolio, and how I take this and move forward. And this is a continuous work. So I would like to see from that experience in terms of making this analysis of simulating portfolios and experience and studies, and as well, implementing this on a personal finance portfolio or as well in, a, in your company on your startup or business. You all, everyone wants to know what's going to happen in the future. Nobody has a crystal ball, at least nobody I've ever met. So the best we can do is try to understand what's happened in the past and why it's happened in the past so that we can make some guesses about what's likely to happen in the future. So in the area of stock and bond market returns, thanks to uh, three professors, I think they're at the London School of Economics, Dimson, L London Business School, 
Dimson, Staunton, and Marsh, that I don't remember their first names, they have done some very extensive studies looking at, I think, 17 countries going back to 1900, looking at the performance of those stock markets and those bond markets over time. So that's a lot more data than your typical mutual fund and brochure that's going to show you five years of performance. When we look at that, there are some very high level conclusions that we can draw about the past. Whether they apply to the future or not is somebody's, their own judgment. But when we look at the past, we see some obvious things, which is on average, stock markets have tremendously outperformed bond markets, which is exactly what you'd expect. There's also been a wide range of annual, average annual returns from just, as I recall, I'm doing this from memory, just above zero to above seven. And if, when you look at those, and, and that doesn't include, well, they say it does, but I don't think that they properly include it. Certain markets went to zero. For example, Russia, prior to 1917, when they had the communist revolution, there was some stock market in Russia that went to zero. Dimson, Staunton, and Marsh look at Germany and they don't have Germany going to zero. And I'm not sure if that's right or not, because there were two instances in the 20th century where you could argue that for the average German, if they were lucky enough to survive, <laughs> their investment still went to zero. But anyway, those are all, those are details. What's I think important is if you, if you, if you could have invested in the world portfolio from in 1900, despite two world wars, a depression, the, the, the Spanish flu, which killed like 2% of the world's population, threat of nuclear war, the Cold War, all that stuff, you would have done really well. If you had done, if you had invested in the worst market, you wouldn't have done very well at all. And I think if you further look at that and you say, which markets did well over that long period, which included the two world wars, which I think are absolutely crucial because the best performing markets were all either physically very distant, such as the United States and South Africa, physically very distant from the, especially the Second World War, which was global, and there were only a few places that it didn't actually touch, or they were neutrals. Like Sweden did very well, relatively, considering where it was, because it was, well, I think, because it was neutral, basically didn't get destroyed like all of Europe, pretty much. Although, you know, you could point to Spain and they say, well, Spain was neutral. Basically, I think it's, I mean, it's fortunate. In the U.S., we have this problem particularly. Most U.S. investors are massively overweight in the U.S. The U.S. stock market accounts for roughly 55% of total global stock market cap, but the U.S. economy only accounts for about a quarter of global GDP. And so I think particularly for U.S. investors, they have to take a close look at, should I really be overweight in the U.S. just because I live in the U.S.? And we talk about that, but I think if, if you're saying, you know, 100,000 foot level, how do I think about this? The past provides some prologue for the future. Because if we think that the future is broadly like the past and the world doesn't destroy itself, I mean, we don't know, God forbid, but a globally diversified portfolio of equities, if the past is at all prologue to the future, that's probably the lowest risk. It's not going to be the highest return because the highest return would be you have some crystal ball and you pick whatever market or company is going to do the best. But that's probably the lowest risk way to approach it. And I agree with you. That's, that's the, this kind of knowledge that we have to keep moving, especially if you want to do this. So I know that we passed your time. So one last question. And I think this question is particular. Your book touches the word decoded. Mm -hmm. So we are in a time of AI. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, 90% of the trading ecosystems in the world, for, I'm talking professional trading, are using algorithms and artificial intelligence, machine learning systems. And increasingly right now, even ChatGPT is doing right now portfolio management or at least some investment advisory basic instruction. So how do you see the picture of AI when it comes to personal finances? And I, I know that you have multiple generations. So this is probably a bit about the present and future. But how do you see this increasing on this part of the investor dilemma decoded? Well, I think there's two sort of separate questions there, Dennis. There's the AI boom or bubble, depending on your point of view. Yeah. And then there's what's the long run effect of AI likely to be on how people invest. Let me take 
the first one very briefly. I believe that there will be that the AI boom or bubble is probably like most past technological booms or bubbles. And so we can go all the way back to the early 20th century with the automobile industry or the electric industry, where you have lots and lots and lots of competitors. And it's very hard to predict who's going to be the few winners, or even much more recently, go back to the internet boom in the 1990s. And many of your viewers are old enough to remember that in real time. And there were lots and lots of companies. And it would have been, and that looking back, I mean, with the information that was available at that time, it was very hard to say Amazon's going to be a big winner. And these hundred other dot coms are all going to be completely gone and forgotten. So I think the AI bubble or boom, whatever, is likely to be similar. They're likely, it's going to be an important technology. It already is. I don't think that it's going to completely overturn the world. I'm not personally worried about like the AI singularity or the whatever, whatever, you know, the doomsayers say about AI. I think AI is another technology. It's a useful technology. And if we look at the, so then at the bigger question is how is it going to change people's lives? If we, this is one of the things that I think history is so important for. AI is not the first, oh, this is going to completely revolutionize the world. Yes, it may revolutionize the world, but it's not going to make human life impossible or whatever. If it, there's a good side and a bad side, like a lot of technologies, and if you go back 200 years, the, I think the introduction of steam trains probably changed the way that humans live a lot more than AI will. Before the introduction of steam trains, which is only 200 years ago, most people never went beyond a few miles of where they were born. And that's just the way the world was. It was transportation was very time consuming, expensive, and very risky to go more than locally, right? There was no technology to do it. Steam trains changed that. Then if you look a hundred years later or so, electricity. I mean, none of we can't we none of what we can do today is possible without electricity. Obviously, when you know, Edison invented the light bulb. I doubt if he foresaw that you and I would be able to be having this conversation from 8,000 miles apart or whatever it is. But it's hard to me. I mean, electricity took, it's still changing the world. I think AI is, I don't know if it'll be as profound as either of those two. I mean, those are almost unbelievably large. We can't imagine life without, without electricity or without modern modes of travel, right? I mean, we just can't. And I think AI is maybe it'll be that transformative. Maybe it won't. I don't know. It's, maybe it's a personal thing. It's like in some ways for people like us, what we're doing right now, the internet was obviously completely transformative. But it didn't, to bring it back to personal investing, I don't think unless you know what you're doing, you don't make some outsized bet on AI unless you know what you're doing, which for most of us is going to be, no, don't make an outsized bet on AI. Do I think that AI is ready to be, would I, want an a, would I recommend anybody an AI advisor? Not today. And that's based on my experiences with things like chat GPT, which sometimes are really good, but sometimes are really frighteningly bad because they don't know what they're saying, right? I mean, in my view, artificial intelligence is a misnomer. It's not intelligent at all. It doesn't, it's not even aware. As a, I like the way you put it. I think I'm probably seeing it as more of a risk, but it's an interesting one. And that in itself is probably another another episode. So I want to wrap up and bear in mind respect for your time. So for people listening to us, first of all, I want to sincerely appreciate and be grateful for the time Dr. Roger DeSeal took with us. We spoke a lot about the investor dilemma, decoded all the principles around this. Please look at the book, The Investor Dilemma, The Code, Recognize Misinformation, Filter the Noise, and Reach Your Goals, which I think is very important. That's one of the things I love about your focus. The book is available on Wiley, it's all over the internet and all over any Amazon or stores that you can find worldwide. And of course, learn with all the different books of Dr. Roger, The Silk, and all the opportunities. I'm very grateful to have you here. Appreciate your time and your dedication and your passion that you have very practical passion and for people listening to us, filter the noise and reach your goals. I think I need that a lot. Thank you so much. Dennis, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. My honor. Thank you. 